The age of colonialism began in the time of Akbar and Jahangir. And in fact, this fascinating painting by Dip Chand in the 18th century, so the 1700s, shows us Mughal style painting used to depict an official of the British East India Company. Around 1600, Europe was witnessing the emergence of capitalist enterprise. The race for profits, for profit-making commodities, pushed an age of exploration. And Queen Elizabeth is shown here standing on a map, declaring her ambition to enhance Britain's power by creating an empire using her powerful navy and linking that empire and its powerful navy to the commercialized profits of corporations. So the British East India Company was a corporation of investors that were seeking profit-making resources across the world. The British had already colonized Ireland in 1536, outlawing their native language, sending Protestant settlers to rule over the indigenous people. And as capitalist corporations grew, this would be done on a much larger scale. Remember, a fundamental skill of critical thinking is grounding your analysis in a precise dictionary definition of your key terms. So let's do that. What is colonialism? It is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. So the age of colonialism from about 1599, expanding until about 1900, was a time when the European major powers, Britain and France, Spain, particularly those three, they, they colonized huge portions of the world. So the mint green reflects the British colonies, uh, Canada, this massive colony, Egypt, Sudan, the south parts of Africa, Australia, and India. France, on its own quest for colonization, has taken possession of so-called French West Africa. So the process of Britain gaining control in India took several centuries from the very beginnings, and it was a process of Britain establishing outposts and defeating local rulers and using the military power of the British Empire as its backing. By the 19th century, by the time of Queen Victoria, the British would think of India as the British Raj, Raj rule, that it was the crown jewel of their colonial empire, and English would be established as the official language of the subcontinent, similar to what had happened in Ireland. This process of colonization involved the imposition of European culture. And one of the things your textbook do does is to point out that the way the British imposed British or European culture in India shifted a bit. So both of these architectural monuments are statements of victorious British power in India, and especially the fact that this India gate is a form known in European culture as a triumphal arch that goes back to the ancient Roman Empire, an arch where a military would parade through the arch, coming back to celebrate Roman victory. So this is very much about victory, but it is actually a little bit less obnoxious, or to use the textbook's term, strident, than this earlier train station, Victoria Terminus, named after the Queen, of course, in Mumbai. The reason the textbook calls this strident is because it is such an extreme imposition of European cultural heritage. It's a Railway. So it's a modern train station, you know, and railways are the technology of resource extraction. You lay down railroads, as the British did, when you want to be able to move 
commodities in your profit-making ventures. But this railway station is designed to look like a Gothic cathedral, the famous style of sacred architecture that developed in France and then spread out to all of Europe at around 1200 to 1400. So it has all of this elaborate stonework and these kind of like wedding cake lacy curlicues of stone that were originally designed to celebrate Christian sacred experience. And in these Gothic cathedrals, there were numerous sculptures depicting things like here at the center, it's too tiny to see, but there's the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. So sculptures like that appear here on Victoria Terminus, but now these sculpted figures are abstract ideas about modern progress including one that is a sculpted figure representing progress, another representing commerce, agriculture, science. So in a sense, claiming that the British project of economic development in India is something almost sacred and is something that is a blessing upon India. So the people of India, <laughs> might have had a different opinion, as this painting shows. So the difference between Bishatir's painting of Jahangir and this painting of the Maharaja Jaswant Singh of Marwa, Marwar, these, the difference between them tells us a lot about how the rich Mughal culture that is syncretic has been replaced or subordinated to a British culture. This painting is made in the hyper illusionistic style, a kind of what we would call a photographic realism that was preferred by high art audiences in Britain and Europe. And in fact, this is made from a photograph. Photographs had, photography had been invented in Britain and France in 1839. And it is very clear that the artist has taken a photograph and created the artwork from a photograph. There, that partly explains the stiffness and awkwardness of this man's pose. But it is also, this pose also reflects the awkwardness of being a Maharaja, which means great king, who is under the dominance of Britain. So he has this gorgeous jewelry bestowed upon him by Queen Victoria, which actually doesn't enhance his aura of power, like Jahangir's aura of power. It seems to actually sort of crush him under the weight of the British Empire. And then we have all of these kind of everyday details of British style interiors, the carpet, the wall, the, the table with the tablecloth, and his boots make him seem very much a subject of the British Empire rather than a sovereign of his own territory. So part of the process of throwing off the British colonial oppressors will be a reassertion of indigenous tradition, the, the, the many streams of artistic and cultural tradition in India. And I'm quoting the famous African philosopher, Deek, who spoke of needing to decolonize the mind. That's what Franz Fanon said, as part of the process of undoing the political and economic um, constraints of colonialism. So this process of decolonizing the mind meant that painters were turning away from this kind of painting that reflects British academic style and looking back to the traditions of Mughal painting and of Hindu painting prior to the arrival of the British East India Company. And so in terms of iconography, we have a revival of the symbolism that you would learn about when you saw the beginnings of the great tradition of Buddhist art and Hindu art and Jain art. So we see the lotus flowers, we see the palm leaf manuscripts that were used to write the sutras, the sayings of the Buddha. And we see her as a great mother figure, reminding us of Durga, we also see her as having the kind of supple and graceful body that we saw in the Bodhisattva, 
the kind of graces, graceful body that suggests an enlightened presence. And so she is understood to be Mother India. And the reclaiming of Mother India was very much about cultural symbols. So certainly Gandhi knew this. He knew so much that part of the project of gaining political control was winning the hearts and minds of people through an imagery of nonviolent commitment to self-rule, satyagraha, to the kind of soul awakening. So he's, he is working with a famous photographer, American photographer, Margaret Burke White, who's photographing him for Life magazine on the cusp of independence. And her job is to show what he has accomplished. And he is absolutely collaborating with her in choosing to sit on the ground to evoke the lotus position, to evoke, this, to evoke all of those artworks of the seated Buddha, to be quietly reading a form of meditation, if you will, a form of absorption and a form of enlightenment. And then it's wonderful how the spinning wheel is in the, is in the foreground here. And the spinning wheel was part of his campaign to encourage Indians to spin their own cloth so as not to be paying high taxes to the British on cloth. But it's very fortuitous and meaningful that the spinning wheel also resembles the wheel of the Dharma or the wheel of the of samsara, the wheel imagery, the chakra wheel that we have studied, a way of reviving the spirit of India because representation is at the core of political struggle.